Ready to go. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us, both here in person and those that are joining online. Um, it's my absolute privilege and pleasure to welcome Larry Bacow, current president of Harvard University. Um, Larry said I shouldn't give too long an introduction, and I think probably that's true. You all know the man, and he needs no introduction. Um, suffice to say, he's been a, an academic leader for many years now, working at MIT, Tufts, and Harvard, and shuttling in between, it seems. Um, and he's very graciously agreed to join us for a conversation about the role of higher education and the academic community, I guess, in all things global. Um, so thank you for joining us, Larry. It's well, a it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back here at, mm -hmm. at Imperial. I'm, I'm only sorry that your president, Alice Gass, couldn't be with us. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the interest of full disclosure for everybody, one of the last things I did at MIT was that I helped to recruit Alice from Stanford to MIT for a Mm -hmm. to occupy a position remarkably similar uh, mm -hmm. to your own. And she was a, a wonderful appointment and a spectacular colleague and continues to be. And I'm only sorry that health prevents her from being yep. with us here today. And I'm sure Alice would be delighted to be here also. Yeah. We will pass on your kind thoughts. So I'm going to start. We're in a, it seems like we've been lurching from crisis to crisis. Um, and you know, all organizations are struggling to deal with that. Mm -hmm. the, the current most recent one potentially we should have seen coming, but the, you know, the Russian invasion in Ukraine has been, I think, more rapid and more severe than any of us thought was possible. And I just wonder how your own community is responding to that and, and what you feel the role of academic organizations in the world when this kind of event happens. How do we respond to the various calls for action and, and the crisis that we see? And I know, of course, there's a resonant for you personally, given your, your own background. And, yeah, I'd just like some thoughts on, on your response, personal and professional. Sure. Um, well, on a personal basis, uh, what Mary's probably referring to is that both of my parents were uh, immigrants. They were actually refugees coming to the United States. Uh, my father was born in Minsk and before World War II and, and left to escape the pogroms of Eastern Europe. My mother was a survivor of Auschwitz and came to this country, uh, really the only member of her family who survived the war. Uh, when I say this country, my country, mm -hmm. excuse me, I have to remind myself where I am. Um, and, you know, I have to say that at a visceral level, this feels almost like 1939 mm -hmm. all over again. So I think it's important that the world, you know, takes note as it, as it is and as it has. Um, I think that there are, you know, responsibilities that we all bear um, to speak out, uh, to be noticed. I mean, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to do that at Harvard, as I'm mm -hmm. sure you've done it uh, here at Imperial. Uh, but in the end, Institutions like ours influence the world largely through our teaching and scholarship. Um, you know, we've tried to organize the resources of the university at Harvard to focus on mm -hmm. what's happening right now in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, we have a U Ukrainian research institute mm -hmm. uh, at Harvard, which uh, has been very, very active um, in this area. Uh, we've tried to do more than that. A number of the members of our medical school literally have gone to Ukraine to try and yeah. render uh, medical assistance. Um, we've been trying to support our students and faculty and staff who have family in Ukraine to, mm -hmm. to see what we can, yeah. uh, what we can do there. Uh, on a broader level, though, I think that at times of tension between nations, um, it's important to maintain uh, scholarly connections mm -hmm. between institutions. Uh, there are things which we as universities can do that our governments sometimes find it challenging yeah. or hard to do. I think back to the, you know, to the Cold War, when uh, a group of scientists, actually from the United States and Russia, met on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's called Pugwash. Mm -hmm. It originated yep. um, in Nova Scotia, uh, and they were concerned about the threat of nuclear war. And ultimately, this led laid the groundwork uh, for what turned out to be the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, mm -hmm. uh, which occurred uh, in the Kennedy administration. Uh, when I was a young faculty member at MIT in 1979, I recall when the first delegation of Chinese scientists came to MIT after the United States and China normalized uh, mm -hmm. relations. And what was interesting is that in many cases they were greeting their former colleagues, mm -hmm. people who they had gone to graduate school with, or in some cases for those who had studied MIT, their faculty members. And the, the bonds that had formed between individuals, between scholars, um, pre-revolution, sort of sustained people. So I think these personal relationships mm -hmm. are important. And again, I think uh, scholarly relationships are, are important to maintain even 
maybe especially during times of tension between uh, between nations. Okay, no, I agree. And I think with the term that we often hear is science diplomacy and how that precedes political diplomacy. Absolutely. I think it's really important. And I guess on a, on a broader piece then, thinking about um, international partnerships more generally, we're having a lot of conversation in Priel at the moment about how we embed values and our values in our organization and in, in, in organization decision making. Right? So how do you, how do you see in, in, your, in your history this balance between working with um, individual academics um, versus state entities and, and you know, balances between human rights and the climate crisis and ongoing collaboration? Are there some red lines for you where you think, well, actually, th this argument that we've just both fully agreed on on scientific yep. diplomacy doesn't hold there? Well, it, you know, first of all, individuals are not necessarily responsible for their policies mm -hmm. of their governments. Correct. Uh, you know, I went to college during the, the height of the Vietnam War in which uh, many of us were actively protesting at the time U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And, uh, uh, you know, I think history mm. sort of has shown that our government was misguided in its efforts. But I would argue that the world would have been a poorer place if um, U.S. students, U.S. scholars had been excluded from conversations with their colleagues around the world simply because they disagreed with the, the policies of mm -hmm. their government. I suspect many of you, uh, regardless of where you are from, uh, if you're citizens of the U.K. or citizens of any other country, agree with all the policies of your governments. And so I, I think it's important not to con conflate mm -hmm. um, actions of a government with actions uh, or, or the nationality of individuals. Mm -hmm. No, it's especially I, important now. I think it's especially important now. And so how do you, talking about that. In, in fact, when I say, can I just put a yeah, finer point don't. on it? Especially in our country right now where, you know, our, our government, for example, um, has, has viewed with suspicion mm -hmm. many Chinese students mm -hmm. or Chinese scholars. Um, and I think that uh, that's exacted enormous cost upon um, scholarly exchange, but also upon individuals. And I think that's wrong. So let me just acknowledge that. Well, I think we're in heated agreement on that. We, we were talking earlier about where we might, where I might challenge Larry on certain issues, and I think we're just going to be agreeing on lots of things. So maybe you can just be deliberately controversial on something. And we well, can... you like one kind of football, I like another. <laughs> well, so that's right. We can talk about that. Um, so I mean, that does lead us to the, this idea of free speech, right? Which of course is enshrined in the U.S. in your Constitution, and we have a lot of debate here about free speech on campus and protecting that. And that seems to be being squeezed on all sides, right? So, and, and it is linked to your, you know, the ability to protest Vietnam. In an organization like Imperial, like Harvard, how do you protect that on campus and make sure that you, you still manage to hear all voices and what protects that freedom? Well, you know, I think that one of the things that has actually made this a difficult issue mm -hmm. on all of our campuses these days is technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, one of the constraints on speech at the moment is, you know, the fact that anything that I utter here right now, mm -hmm. for example, is being broadcast to the world. And if I say something that somebody finds offensive, uh, immediately, mm -hmm. you know, yep. it, it will uh, inspire some to, mm -hmm. to weigh in on mm -hmm. this, uh, which isn't such a big deal for me because I'm used to this. Mm -hmm. I'm a public figure. But on the other hand, if, if this were not a public event as it is right now, but just a normal Imperial College class, as mm -hmm. this room is, yep. I'm sure, used yep. to do. And somebody says something controversial or which somebody might find offensive, and one of you, as, as a student, would tweet about it, let's say. All of a sudden, this ceases to be an issue just for the class, where one, you know, we have the opportunity. If we disagree mm -hmm. as, as students, as students and faculty mm -hmm. members, we can work that out. But in the environment in which we live on, you know, the entire world can now descend upon an individual who's been singled out mm -hmm. for saying something. And I think that, in more than anything else, mm -hmm. inhibits speech. Um, when we deal with this on our campus, you know, I try to, to make the point that our motto is veritas, truth. And truth is to be distinguished from facts. Mm -hmm. Facts are incontrovertible, at least they used to be in mm -hmm. our country. Uh, <laughs> but, but truth is something that needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. It needs to be revealed. And that can only happen in an environment in which people are willing to engage in serious debate. Um, and not just where they're willing to engage with people who think differently from them. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to be willing to be proven wrong. Right? Um, it, you know, believing in truth doesn't mean 
that, that my job is to persuade you that I'm right mm -hmm. and you're wrong. It's to engage in a mutual search for truth. And nobody has a monopoly on it. So we have to be willing to engage with, uh, with others. Uh, the dean of Harvard College, Rakesh Karana, has a, a wonderful way sometimes mm -hmm. in dealing with students who come to him all charged up because they want to change the world. And Rakesh says, that's wonderful, but mm -hmm. let me ask you a question. Have you ever changed your mind? Mm -hmm. Because the only way you're going to change the world is to persuade others to change their mind. And if you don't know what that means yourself, you're unlikely to persuade others. So I think we need to get in the face mm -hmm. sometimes of our students and others and sort of say, look, um, you, you need to be persuaded by a better argument or by new information, mm -hmm. better data. Uh, and if you're not willing to do that, then you're not really committed to truth. And that's what we're fundamentally about. And do you find it's easy to make that argument? No. I mean, how, and, and is it getting is it getting harder? I guess yes. that, there's a perception. Is that actually, do you also feel that? Yeah. Uh, it is getting harder. Uh, it, it's it's getting harder because uh, I think there are many who feel that being confronted with ideas that make them feel uncomfortable will claim that they no longer feel safe, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that we have an, an obligation to make everybody feel safe. You know, my response to that is that we have an obligation to prepare you for the world that you will inhabit when you, when you leave Harvard or when you leave mm -hmm. Imperial. And the world is gonna, isn't going to teach you, treat you with kid gloves just because you have an Imperial College degree or a Harvard mm -hmm. uh, degree. And so you need to learn how to deal uh, with people who are going to get in your face, because this is going to happen for the rest of your life. Uh, that's the world we live in. It is. So that leads me, I guess, to another, another issue I really wanted to talk about, which was um, diversity and inclusion, right? Okay. Because a lot of these issues do center around some, some very sensitive issues and, and, and people's individual responses to them versus the legal framework and, and social dynamics. And, and both, it's interesting, both Harvard and Imperial use the language of inclusive excellence which I think is a really important distinction in, I guess, making the point that, yes, we want diversity and inclusion um, on a moral perspective, right, that, that we should be open to all that and the equality of opportunity. But there's also an, an imperative for excellence because the more diverse your teams are, the better your results. So I think there's, there's this multifaceted descriptor that I think is really important. But some of the big challenges you get in a community and in making like, an inclusive community around these very issues around challenging individuals. So I, I wonder how you've kind of been evolving your strategy, how you kind of think about that participation in your community and, and what, what have you learned? Are there specific tools or techniques that, that have worked to, to promote a better environment? Well, so I think it's worth sort of just framing things quite precisely. Mm -hmm. You know, why do we believe in diversity? Mm -hmm. Uh, we believe in it, I think, for two reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one is we learn from our differences. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, Harvard, Imperial, any institution would be really dull mm -hmm. if everybody came from the same background, wanted to study exactly the same thing, wanted to pursue precisely the same kind of career, who thought the same way about every issue. I mean, we learn from our differences. And I think we have all actually at some point been in groups like that. <laughs> right. Uh, we have. Yeah. But the second reason that we believe in diversity is that we can never hope to achieve as much yeah. by sampling from a fraction of the mm -hmm. distribution of talent that's available yeah. to us than by sampling from all of them. All of it. And you know, we know that talent tends to be flatly distributed, mm -hmm. but is. opportunity is not. Correct. And so what we have a chance to do at places like this is to extend opportunity to people. That sometimes requires us to think more broadly about how we, uh, how we recognize talent or what are the, what are the indices um, uh, of talent. Uh, for anybody who's been following things in the United States, our admissions policies, for example, have been uh, subject to unbelievably close scrutiny because we're being sued. Uh, charging that we're discriminating against some students, mm -hmm. specifically Asian students, mm -hmm. uh, because the plaintiffs in this legal case have argued that if we were to admit people basically on the basis of grades and SAT scores, mm -hmm. standardized test scores, the class would look different than it actually does. You know, my response to that is who amongst us would like to only be measured by our numbers? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, 
if anybody here has ever hired anybody, you've hired people, mm -hmm. I'm I sure. Um, you know, do we hire people without interviewing them? No. Nope. Do we hire people without checking their references? Mm -hmm. Do we hire people without looking at their work mm -hmm. product? Um, do we hire people without exploring their own experiences? If the answer is no, well then, why would we admit people, you know, to these programs without looking broadly mm -hmm. at at all of their experience? Okay. And so then, what you're what you're really talking about, and this is a challenge, I guess, for all organisation, is is how do you assess potential? Right? Because you're looking you're looking to assess potential rather than just assess previous opportunity and attainment, right? Which we know has multiple privilege factors. Exactly. Right? So, so what do you do to try and Think about ways to assess potential, so you can you do get that broad, inclusive excellence. Yeah. Well, that well I would turn the question around and ask you, Mary. When you hire people, mm -hmm. what do you do to assess potential when you hire them? You look at the whole person. Mm -hmm. You look at from whence they've come. Um, you know, when I'm looking at a, I, when I was at MIT, I used to read admissions folders every one of the 24 years I was on the faculty mm -hmm. at MIT, and you know, I would look at a student differently. Um, who came to our country, um, you know, at the age of 14, not mm -hmm. speaking English, mm -hmm. okay, um, when they were applying to MIT, then I would somebody who had been, you know, raised as a native English speaker uh, yep. here their entire yep. life. Uh, if that same student had spent 25 or 30 hours a week um, working mm -hmm. while they were in high school, I would have factored that into yep. um, how they had yep. performed. Uh, so I think, again, we, we look at potential by, uh, you know, th there's not a perfect algorithm, no, let's put it that way. And it, it, mm -hmm. it involves judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, our jobs would be a lot easier if we never had to exercise judgment. That it would be if everything was black and white. And I guess in the UK that there's, there's a, a lot of debate now around what we, what's th th this exact thing you're talking about is called a contextual offer. Right, so you look at the whole person and on that, on that basis you judge what, is, what do they then need to get into your organisation. Right, and it's a very controversial topic, and, it, and, and, it, and it's largely, I think, controversial because of the elite protecting a position, that it's not transparent, and that actually, if we are making that judgment, who, who gives us that authority, right? And so it's about, I guess, being, like you've said, being open and being inclusive and making it clear the kind of things you're talking about including, right, and, and, and how you reach that sense of context and challenge. Yeah. But I would argue that one of the goals of higher education, more broadly, uh, is in fact to create social and economic mobility mm -hmm. within a society. Uh, and so we need to recognize that we have the capacity uh, to alter the trajectory of people's mm -hmm. lives. And as we think about that, mm -hmm. that then the, you know, the admissions process becomes one of whose lives are we going to alter? Mm -hmm. It does. It does. So I'm going to. I know I haven't got very. The window, I am going to let you all have some questions in a minute. Don't worry. I'm not going to totally monopolize the conversation. But I do want to talk a little bit about. We, we've talked about you know initially coming in as um, global challenges, right? And and the idea of a global community. The the biggest one. Climate. Climate. So, you know, it, it's an existential crisis, and it's been existential for some time. The government. The governments around the world, I think, have been slow to respond. Um, and I think that lots of organizations like ours have got initiatives to try and address that at our level. So, so would you talk a little bit through your thinking in Harvard? I know you've got some new positions, thinking about driving the agenda, I guess, and, and this combined role, I guess, of, of thought leadership, because I think that's an important piece that we have to drive, but then also enabling change, right, and where we can both um, deliver you know, technology, for example. Is there, is there a way we can accelerate technology, but also then partnerships to, to drive the transition? So it, it is. I will ask you about five questions, then yeah, one. <laughs> it, it is the existential threat that we, mm -hmm. that we, that we face as a planet. Although, uh, you know, if growing up mm -hmm. in my age, people would have said nuclear war. Mm -hmm. That may mm -hmm. also be back on the agenda mm -hmm. for the future. We'll see. Uh, it, you know, the way in which institutions like ours, again, influence the world is through our teaching and mm -hmm. scholarship. And I think in both areas, we have opportunities uh, to do more. Um, you know, we have 12 schools at Harvard. There's not a single one, actually, that's not involved mm -hmm. in doing uh, scholarship that in one way or another doesn't influence how we approach this, this challenge of climate change. 
And I would tell you that even includes our divinity school. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to one of your colleagues mm -hmm. um, just before this meeting. He sort of looked at me and said, the divinity school? And I said, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would tell you that you know, the vast majority mm -hmm. of the science here mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. is settled mm -hmm. right? Yep. in terms of climate change. Yep. It's, it's really not an issue. Um, uh, you're an engineer. As you know, there's certainly lots of technological mm -hmm. change which will be driven uh, by engineering, and we hope we can accelerate that. But the really big question that we face, I think, as a planet um, is either, you can call it philosophical or, or an ethical mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. And that, that is, what are the responsibilities of one generation, us, to future generations? You know? How, how many, what kind of costs are we willing to incur mm -hmm. uh, as a society um, in order so that those who come after us will enjoy a life that's at least as good as what we have experienced? Um, that's a philosophical, that's an ethical question. You know? So even our divinity school, I think, yep. has something well, to I say. Think there's and, any, and if I could extend that a little bit, it's, it's not just this generation of Americans to future generations of Americans, yeah. right? It's the, the global generation, Absolutely. which is already massive inequalities, and the impact of climate is going to be also Absolutely. felt very differently. Well, in the same way the pandemic mm -hmm. um, revealed uh, you know, fundamental inequalities in ways that, that were always there, but people didn't see mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, climate change will also, the cost of climate change will be borne by the poorest um, mm -hmm. in the world, wherever they happen to live. So I think that that imposes responsibilities on wealthy countries mm -hmm. like ours. Yep. Okay. But I also think it imposes responsibilities on institutions like ours. Um, it's uh, Harvard is a very decentralized place, and so it's difficult to drive. Um, you'll appreciate this as a vice provost for research. It's difficult to drive the faculty agenda by issuing orders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that rarely works. Uh, so what we do is that we, we look for ways to make it easier for people to collaborate mm -hmm. um, across disciplines. We look for ways to make it easier to work in collaboration with industry, because this is a problem which will not be solved mm -hmm. uh, by scholarship alone uh, of academics. It's, it's one where we really need to engage uh, with, with industry and especially parts of, of industry whose behavior needs to change the most if we're going to make uh, real progress mm -hmm. on this. We need to think about ways in which we can uh, work across institutions so that people can see a future for them that's, that's better than the present. What do I mean by that? Uh, there are many people, at least in my country, I don't mm -hmm. know about yours, although I suspect it's not that different here, who look at the kinds of policies that we're envisioning um, and the kinds of changes, shifts that will have to take place in, in terms mm -hmm. of economic activity, and they see themselves as net losers. You now, if you're a coal miner in West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, those who want to regulate climate change, mm -hmm. probably not going to make your life yep. better in the short run. And we can't just look at people like that and sort of say, well, it's got to happen. You've got to go along. We need to, to think creatively about how we help them through this transition. And you know, one project which we're working on at Harvard in collaboration with our colleagues at MIT is uh, in doing precisely this. How do, we, um, how do we help regions of the country that are dependent upon extraction economies mm -hmm. yep. um, manage through a transition uh, so that they're not giving up their economic future in ways that allow all the rest of us to preserve arguably a better life uh, for our children and, and for others. So we, we need to take a broader view of this and not just sort of see people as, oh, you're obstructionist because you don't get it. Mm -hmm. No, in fact, the people who are in many cases are opposing things are opposing them out of self-interest and they're, they're actually quite rational mm -hmm. in what they're doing. Yep. And if we want to change the conversation, it's incumbent upon us to figure out how we bring them along uh, and help them through through this transition. Yeah. I think that's I think right. Institutions like ours can help with that. I think that's right. And there's a lot of work that we've been doing here around this idea of um, you know the, the structural poverty impacts choices people are able to make. Yes. And if you're developing a technology that you you can just roll out and it will become you know a middle class technology, that's not going to solve the crisis. You have to at the very beginning work with the right teams and think about an equitable transition and how people are able to make better choices. Right. 
think that's really important. So I, I guess we're going to, we might well come back in the questions to your comment around um, industry partners, but um, I am going to open up the room for questions now. And if you're online, please type in any questions you might have. We will be able to take some of those. So does anyone in the room like to ask a question to start us off? Oh, please, come We've on. This is like teaching an exceedingly with, a dull shy. class. I, I will pick on someone. No student I will pick has, on a, has, a, has a question. Nobody's got a question. Nobody oh, has a question. Back. Yeah. Thank you. Well spotted, Layla. You know, in, in Japan they call this Sakura, the, 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 the honor of asking the first question. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm going to start. Maybe it's not the right question to start with because it's, it's slightly controversial. Um, but you were talking about um, how the admission process was was coming under a scrutiny recently. And I've also uh, applied to a number of American universities. And I personally felt there was like a big, like almost you could, uh, uh, um, obsession with like race. And um, I feel like maybe that is one of the reasons why a lot of um, mostly like Asian families have felt like kind of, um, this feeling of injustice because it felt like, you know, um, kind of um, skewed by race. And I was wondering uh, what your take, um, you know, what is Harvard's take, what is your take on like the importance of race uh, as a university? Well, thank you for your question. Um, it is one factor among many. It can never be the decisive factor. But we have 40 years of established law in the United States, which says that, it is in, that there is an interest that institutions like ours have um, in creating an environment in which every student's opportunity to learn is enhanced by the students that they interact with. Um, so we know um, that there are peer effects who you're studying with uh, in a class affects how everybody performs in a class. And we also know that diversity enhances the learning experience for everyone. So then once you recognize that, and the, our Supreme Court has, and again, there's 40 years of case law. We'll see whether or not this Supreme Court upholds it. They may not. But it's been established law for the last four, actually almost five dec decades in the United States that we, we can consider race as one factor among many. Not the decisive factor, but one among many. And if you think about it, for many students, it's really hard if they tell their story not to consider race. Um, you know, I, I actually remember reading an application when I was at MIT of um, a young man who was applying to MIT. He wasn't. He came to this country in ninth grade, our country in ninth grade, from Vietnam. He did not speak English. He was from LA. He worked in his family's um, uh, little grocery store, um, vegetable stand, um, about 25 to 30 hours a week. Uh, and he talked about the hardship that his family experienced escaping from Vietnam when they did, coming to this country, and then establishing roots. And that's what he wrote about in his essay. So one has to then ask, if we cannot consider race or ethnicity, what would it mean in reading his essay? How do we exclude that? Uh, where he came from, that he escaped during a time of war, that his journey to our country was fraught, uh, that in, in his case, not all of his family made it out. Um, that he felt like he was parachuted into a very alien environment when he wound up in LA. I mean, it is who he is. And so if we are going to consider people and their potential, it's almost impossible, not at some level, to consider race or ethnicity. And, and, and so, Again, it's one factor among many. It's, it's not the decisive factor, but in considering people and, and who they are and the experience that they bring 
you know, to not just the classroom, but to the learning that occurs outside the classroom, it's one factor among many. And that's how we, that's how we think about it. Okay. Thanks. Just one in the middle. Good. Thank you again for your question. Uh, I, if people don't mind, tell me just what you're studying. I'm, I'm curious. It'll help me. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, over here. Um, in, in what field? Uh, electrical engineering. Um, so you spoke about how institutions like Harvard, uh, Imperial, have the potential to alter the trajectory of somebody's life. Um, but you can't deny the fact that one of the biggest barriers towards that is the cost of education, especially in a country like US. And if I went to grad school in the US, so I'm particularly aware of this one. Do you think the economic business model of universities, especially grad school, needs to be altered in the coming decade or so? Specifically, if you now look at uh, fields like engineering, you could make an argument that um, Companies, a company like Google or somebody could hire some people without college degrees, give them the training that they need, and provide them with a job after the, this one. So what does a university, uh, what value is there in a university to somebody who is particularly impoverished? So. Um there have always been people throughout history who've succeeded and succeeded wildly without a college education, all right? or without a formal education for that matter. And there will continue to be people who do that. Um, the question is whether or not that's the right way for, for, for most people. Um, and the nice thing about our system is that we don't necessarily require, we don't force people to go to school if they don't want to, um, but we offer the opportunity. What we try to do at a place like Harvard, um, and this was true of MIT and it was true of Tufts as well, is to make sure that the education is accessible to everybody regardless of their ability to, of their families to pay. Uh, so while it, if you were to look up the cost of attendance at Harvard, you would be stunned by how expensive it is, and it is breath like, breath, it, it is extraordinarily expensive. On the other hand, if you come from a family um, with essentially a median income equal to that of the median income in the United States, your family will essentially pay nothing to send you uh, to Harvard. That we will cover the cost of attendance um, through scholarships completely. So that's that's true from people for people who come from families with family income of about seventy-five thousand dollars a year or less. So we we try to make sure that it's accessible. Um, and it allows us to admit many, many students who come from families of exceedingly uh, modest means. And by the way, uh, all of our financial aid at the undergraduate level is grant and aid, no loans uh, to students. So students emerge with, mm -hmm. without debt. It's a different question at the graduate or professional level. For doctoral students, uh, again, we tend to cover their costs. Um, uh, they get generous stipends. Um, at the professional level, it's, it's different from somebody who goes to Harvard Business School or business school here at Imperial College. And it's, you know, while we do have financial aid available, um, it's also not unreasonable that people might finance their own education by taking out some debt. And in fact, um, it's, it's actually a pretty good investment if you think about what it costs you to buy a car, which is a depreciating asset, right? The day you drive it off the, mm -hmm. the lot, it's worth less than what you paid for it. Um, if you were to take out the same amount of debt uh, to invest in a degree from mm -hmm. Imperial College, yep. um, I think, well, I suspect, I've looked at the numbers for us. I, I think it's an appreciating asset. Yes. It, is a, it is an yes. appreciating asset. Yep. So it's still mm -hmm. a good in, in mm -hmm. investment decision. Tougher question as to whether or not the business model is sustainable. I will tell you that people have been writing articles for over a half century claiming that the business model for higher education in the United States is not sustainable, mm -hmm. and we're stu still doing 
pretty well. So we'll see. So maybe I could just follow up because there's a question online that kind of links a little bit to this and, and around learnings from the pandemic where we've done a lot more remote teaching and remote learning. And what, what, do, we, what do we carry from that? And, and is there an aspect of that that helps with the widening participation agenda that we need to fulfill? Yeah, I think there are a lot of things which we've learned from the pandemic. Um, on the educational front, you know, it's been a forcing function mm -hmm. uh, for all of us, which have forced us to, to utilize technologies in ways that many faculty never would have imagined. Uh, we did a survey of our faculty and 84% of them said post-pandemic they will teach differently mm -hmm. on campus than mm -hmm. they did pre-pandemic because there are certain things which they've learned mm -hmm. which they want to keep. Yep. So, you know, we will incorporate chat functions in real time in classes like this. Um, we've learned that students, at least at Harvard, are much more willing to attend office hours uh, yep. if they can do so virtually yep. than, mm -hmm. uh, than yep. otherwise. We've learned that it's possible to parachute speakers into a class at zero marginal cost, so mm -hmm. we'll do a lot more of, of that. Uh, we've also learned that it's possible to widen the aperture that is the lens to mm -hmm. Harvard to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, we're gonna do that as well. We're gonna publish a report this next week uh, at Harvard. Uh, it's gonna be a report on the future of teaching and learning. So keep an eye out. For yeah, I, will. I will. In which it. we set it as, a, as an ambitious goal to try and, using technology, reach 5% of the world's learners. That's a big number. That's a very big number. Not through degrees but through content which we're going to try so, and, and so how do you define the world's learners? Is, uh, is it, have you, do you see that as a fixed number, so getting to 5%, or do you see you expanding that number? So, as you know, um, we, 11 years ago, embarked upon an ambitious experiment called edX, mm -hmm. uh, where we tried to provide content to the world at, uh, for free mm -hmm. uh, to try and expand learning opportunities for people who would otherwise not have a chance to get a traditional mm -hmm. education. We formed this joint venture originally with MIT. Mm -hmm. And it was, in many respects, wildly successful, except for one, and that is the people who took advantage of it already had degrees. Yeah. Um, and we realized that we had a last mile problem, and that is it was access to technology, which proved yep. to be the rate limiting factor uh, on the capacity of the people that we wanted to reach. So you know, we're going to really focus heavily on this, uh, on this issue going forward. Okay, good. Any more? Oh, now there's lots of questions. Okay, I'm going to ask the lady next to the man that just asked the question. In the middle. And just tell me what you're studying here, if you're a student. Hi. I'm not a student. Okay, that's, that's allowed. <laughs> it's allowed too, cool. Um, so I come from Belgium, where the education is quite accessible, economically speaking. So our main challenge is um, earlier ed education, because we don't all have the same access to education. Um, so my question is, um, how do you, um, how do you make access to information broader, and how do you um, help diminish the inequality of education outside of a uh, university? That's a great question. Uh, so I think technology has done that largely. I mean, today. Uh, you know, we have students studying at, at Harvard and MIT through edX mm -hmm. who, um, I mean, there's a, there was a kid in Nepal who actually went online and, and took uh, the most popular course at Harvard is CS50, the Introduction to Computer Science. Mm -hmm. And there's an online yeah. version that you're probably mm -hmm. maybe familiar that David Malin does. Yeah. And there was a 14-year-old kid in Nepal who took this course and, and did brilliantly on it. He's now studying um, at Harvard. So... One way of doing it is by pushing content to the world. But again, I go back to what I said earlier mm -hmm. in response to the mm -hmm. last question. If people don't have access to the technology, it's a problem. And so I think that the next wave of technological innovation will, in fact, make this yep. far more accessible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Elon Musk is mm -hmm. already doing it right mm -hmm. now in terms of uh, delivering through satellite, you know, access to the web at high, mm -hmm. at high speeds which over time will help to democratize education. But I think institutions have already done a lot. Um, it used to be that if you wanted access to either the materials of the Harvard libraries or the Harvard museums, you had to have a Harvard ID in order to do it. And now 
the vast majority of that is open and available to anybody in the world who, have, who has mm -hmm. access to the internet uh, because of the degree of digitization. I think that will continue, uh, and that's good. But the rate limiting step is always going to be access to technology. So we need to be willing to take a look at those who have access and those who don't, and we need to focus heavily on ensuring that you know, uh, people have access to that <clears throat> throughout the world. Again, I will repeat what I said earlier. Talent is flatly distributed geographically. <coughs> Excuse me. Opportunity is not. There are proportionately as many brilliant people in some of the poorest parts of the world as there are, you know, mm -hmm. here in Westminster. Um, we need to find them and give them opportunity. Thank you. Over here? Yeah. And then Yellow Jumper next. Okay. So if I refer back, as you just started, we are going from crisis to another, and we don't know what's, it, what's its next. So maybe you looked at it from a management level. If we look at it from a micro level, what's your advice? How we can look to this transition? Like, I remember like when I started in 2019, what I have been through. It's not like within my control. I, maybe one of the words I really hate, which is normal. So how we should look to this transitions or how we can help as we to, rem to, rem to normalize that change on us from a micro perspective. Uh, what are you studying here? Chemical engineering. Okay, so um, at MIT we used to call that the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, All roads lead to chemical engineering. They do. Um, mm -hmm. I would actually tell you to read history um, and try and understand the kinds of transitions that the world has been through in the past. Because, you know, as the saying goes, the only constant is change. And at this point, we seem to be going through a period of accelerating change, um, largely due to developments in technology and other things, which is, you know, as Thomas Friedman has, has written, making the world flatter. Mm -hmm. uh, I left my crystal ball back in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts when I flew over here. so. I can't tell you what the future is going to bring. Uh, but I will tell you that it will be different than the past. And those changes will create opportunities just as they will also create challenges. And so if you study history, you'll have an opportunity to understand how people have capitalized on those opportunities, how they see opportunity where others only see challenges. And if you do that, then. I think you'll probably uh, do well. I, I also would, you know, I always tell students that uh, if you're if you're worried about your career and what the future is going to hold for you, a career is only knowable in retrospect. On the day you retire, you can look back and it all makes sense. You can identify the inflection points, <laughs> and how you got from here to there. But looking forward, you know, it, it, you just have to be prepared to live with a certain amount of uncertainty. But it's actually easier to take risk when you are younger and you have less at stake than it is once you're much older in life. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you have family, you've got an investment already mm -hmm. in a particular you know, set of skills or other things. Mm -hmm. So uh, last piece of advice would be to recognize opportunity when it walks up and hits you in the face, because it will. Yeah, absolutely. So before we, before we come to you, just ask one of the online questions, because it's a little bit related to that one. So, so from our, one of our online contributors, um, the United Nations have urged governments and institutions to use the, the COVID-19 recovery as a springboard for global development, and in particular the SDGs. Um, so I guess it's a little bit like yours. Is there a new normal or is there a new better? All right, what, how do we make the future better? And, and, and are you optimistic or pessimistic that actually we will build back better? So I'm optimistic. Um, and if you ask me why, why are you optimistic, Larry? Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's because we've always mm -hmm. found a way to build back better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about the time that I grew up in. Um, I went to college in 1969. And I would tell you that in 1969, the world looked even darker than it does today. OK? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at least in, in my country, the Vietnam Wars, war was tearing the country apart. and 
you know, uh, the conflict. Many people were dying um, in that region of the world. Um, it was, you know, my last year in high school, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. There were riots um, in, in the major cities throughout the United States. Uh, deeply, deeply polarized uh, country and, and, and the world itself uh, at the time. And, and we managed to get through that. And we came together. Mm -hmm. And there was renewed prosperity. And, you know, I, I, I believe in the capacity of people um, to seize the moment and find ways to, to address the grand challenges of the world. I mean, look at what we've just mm -hmm. done in the last two years mm -hmm. with COVID, yep. right? Yep. Um, and it's remarkable if you think about it, notwithstanding the seven million people who've mm -hmm. died throughout the world, an extraordinary tragedy. But we've been able to develop vaccines. And we're doing a better job now of distributing these vaccines around the world. And uh, let us not forget that the vaccines, while produced in a year, mm -hmm. remarkable in its own way, were based upon 30 years worth of, of research in basic science that made those vaccines possible. So you know, I, I believe in, in what we do at places like this, mm -hmm. which really is to invent the future and try and invent a better future for all of us. And thank you for waiting. Uh, thank you for the talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm doing my PhD here uh, in computer science. Uh, I wanted to, you started this discussion today with the Ukraine um, crisis right now. So I wanted to ask the question, basically, what sort of action, what's the, what plans the Harvard like, measures uh, take to, I don't know, support everyone uh, involved or affected by this crisis, for example, your Ukraine or Russian researchers, students, etc. And also, why? I mean, we live in a world full of uncertainty and full of conflict. I'm just wondering if the sort of actions and plans that you now took uh, are they different from all the other conflicts over the last several years? So, you know, there are. Um Limits to what academic institutions can do. We may be Harvard, but we're not, we're not a country. Um, we don't have the resources of a country. Uh, what we can do is uh, we can shine a spotlight on this conflict. We can bring to bear upon the conflict the collected scholarship of, of faculty who uh, have been studying this region for years. Um, we can help inform debate about what kinds of policies might be reasonable for governments like yours or, or ours to pursue under these, under these circumstances. Um, we can show solidarity with the Ukrainian people, which we've tried to do uh, in a whole variety of ways. And then we can, we can support our people, um, uh, students, faculty, staff from Ukraine, from Russia, we also need you know, uh, support uh, at times. But uh, let me be clear. There are limits to what, what we can do as academic institutions. And people should recognize that, uh, that are different from what governments uh, can do. Um, and uh, we're doing what, we, what I think we can both institutionally and also as individuals, as I said, uh, whether or not people have Going to Ukraine, what we're doing to uh, support Ukrainian scholars, as we did scholars from Afghan, Afghanistan, who tried to get, mm -hmm. you know, out of their scholars at risk program, which I suspect mm -hmm. yeah. Imperial participates in, as we do as well. Yeah. Okay. So just on that, on that note, so you talked about um, responding to crises and being open and, and cognizant, but also. I guess that we come back to delivering that thought leadership. And so the, I'm, I'm gonna, the final question from online is, should we change how we work, how we collaborate, um, how we talk to government to better embed the, the things that come out of our organizations into the minds of policymakers or into the minds of industry leaders? Do we do an okay job of that? Should we do it differently? Can we do it better? Well, I, I don't know how Imperial is viewed, but there are many people um, in the United States who think that we do too good a job of it at Harvard, <laughs> uh, that we're too embedded in the government um, as it stands. Uh, 
you know, um, over 10 percent of the members of Congress Correct. of our Congress have Harvard degrees or are alumni. But are, but are they following the current research outputs of Harvard? Is is your work influencing policy the way it should? I mean, this is I mean, through the pandemic, our government said for most of the time they were following the science. Um, that's not always true, I think, in many places. And, and we certainly haven't been following the science in response to the climate crisis. So how do we, is there a way to better, I guess, articulate what we know and, and I guess, the foundations of the knowledge that, that really needs to influence policy? I think the biggest way we um, influence policy is through a form of technology transfer, which I like to call commencement. Mm -hmm. You know, every year we send forth yeah. um, another crop of yeah. students into yeah. the world, um, you know, equipped with sort of knowledge and I hope values and sensitivities, which they will use to try and make the world a better place. Uh, and over time, those those graduates assume positions of responsibility and authority. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. it's a matter of some pride that the Secretary of State, you know, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Energy, the Secretary of Transportation. I could go down the mm -hmm. list of Harvard alumni who are serving yeah. in our government uh, at the moment. And this is true, by the way, in almost every administration, mm -hmm. whether or not it's Republican mm -hmm. or, or, or Democrat. So we encourage our alumni, our students, to live lives of meaning, to use their degrees, not just to better themselves, but to make the world a better place that with the privilege of an education that what gets one gets at a place like Imperial or at a place like Harvard comes responsibility. And if we have a responsibility, mm -hmm. it's to convey that to all of you, to future generations, that, you know, your education comes with that responsibility and, and that's to take a world that is imperfect in so many different mm -hmm. ways and try and repair it, whether or not that means extending opportunity to future generations, just like it has been extended to each and every one of us. If you're sitting in this room, that's a good indication that you have had benefits that have escaped the vast majority of people living uh, in, uh, in throughout the world. And okay. that bears responsibility. I was going to say that's a beautiful note to to end on, but I, I have somebody really, really wants to ask a question. You've got like 10 seconds in the middle of the back. <laughs> so thank you for this fruitful uh, conversation. I'm doing a PhD in civil engineering. So um, um, regarding this technology transfer thing, what you said, it's a more of an indirect way, like to how to, to, um, to increase the impact of such um, uh, efforts. But what do you think of a more formalized and more organized way that universities like ours can do in order to maximize such impact and maximize such uh, uh, technology transfer uh, efforts. So uh, in terms of a formalized effort. So, so beyond people, right? So I think you, you've, yeah. I, I yeah. think, you know, our people are our best asset, right? So, but you're talking about beyond people, what so, could be done? So I think there's been a sea change in how people view universities. And this has occurred not just outside the university, but within the university. We used to be accused of being ivory towers removed from society, where scholars went to, be, to think big thoughts, <laughs> unpolluted, if you will, by the issues of the day. Um, that's a pretty ancient view of what institutions like ours do now. Um, we are places where people get their hands dirty, where faculty interact routinely, not just with industry, but with policymakers. Um, in which there are opportunities for students when they come to places like this to engage with people, not just faculty members like us, but others who routinely come to this campus. And I think that is part of our responsibility uh, to make the, the boundaries of our, of our campus, the borders of our campuses, much more porous, both to ideas coming in, but also ideas uh, going out to technologies that are invented here. It's our responsibility, and actually I would, I would tell you 
probably yeah. your principal yep. responsibility, mm -hmm. given the job that you have yep. here, Mary, at Imperial, uh, to speed those technologies into the marketplace so that they can have a positive and beneficial impact on the world. And the good news is that uh, at every major research university in the world, there's somebody now mm -hmm. like, like you, Mary, with your job. I suspect you have the equivalent of what we would call a technology licensing office mm -hmm. or development we office. We do. Yep. None of which existed probably yeah. 50 years ago. Um, and that is another way in which we uh, engage the world. So, yeah. I think that's right. I mean, I think it's, in general, taking a really holistic view of impact on society, right? And we used to see that as people and knowledge. And now we see it as translation and direct, direct yes. engagement. And that's really important. So I think we are out of time. Um, so at least we're going to stop broadcasting. There might be the opportunity if you're going to hang around for a few minutes to talk to some members of the audience. Um, but I would just like to take a final opportunity to thank you for joining us. It's been really refreshing both to have something in person, but also to have such an optimistic um, conversation about the future when we've been through, I guess, roller coaster of a few years and we're still in the middle of crisis to have a, a sense of hope and a sense of hope in places like this. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mary. And thank you all for your great questions. And um, now go out and make the world a better place. We need you to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.